Welcome all ye vibranters to episode 26, a mystical number if there ever was one. We're joined with, uh, we've got a holy trinity here, might even be a quaternity before too long. Mario from Symbolic Studies, first time on my channel. Mario has amazing work. He's a professional graphic designer and he brings that skill set to making concise and gorgeously beautiful and very well researched correspondence videos that will teach you about all kinds of secrets in the stars. So Mario, I'm really glad you're here. Check out Symbolic Studies on YouTube. And if you want more of this dude, he was also our honored guest on Weaving Spiders Welcome 65 last Saturday. And if you all don't know Gabriel yet, you ought to because he's always around. <laughs> it seems like every day he's got the new, new, really amazing gnosis. It's like you just wake up with ideas in your head. You're you're a true, that's <laughs> true exactly. mystical terminator. That's so, exactly yeah, what happens. We're here and um, why don't we, maybe I'll go over a couple of quick business items. First of all, I wanna screen share and show, show Mario's channel. Uh, so here we go. This is Symbolic Studies right here. Some really awesome stuff. I particularly enjoyed his uh, video series about the connection between serpents and dragons and snakes. That was really good stuff. But as you can see, it's chock full of amazing stuff from tarot to astrology. You can also find him on TikTok and Instagram. So check all that out. Also want to remind everyone that I've got the new audiobook for July's End with Black Swans, narrated by yours truly, that you can check out for free if you've never done Audible before. But it's worth the price of admission if you want to just buy it, or if you've already got Audible and want to use one of your monthly tokens on it. I highly recommend. This was a huge project for yours truly, and I learned so much going through this and reading over the chapters, listening over them again and again. I really can't overstate how useful it is to get the synchro mystic look at how these etymological connections in the phonetic Kabbalah connect all the different cults, mystery traditions, mythologies, and religions throughout time and history and demonstrate that it's all the sun, baby. <laughs> so there's that. I'm going to drop that link in the, uh, in the, what you call it, the chats and right. So I know that we've got probably plenty of interesting ground to cover. No plan, but shooting from the hip. Except I do have a plan that I want Gabriel to show off his new cipher. Now that I'm done with all that introductory stuff, Mario, welcome to the channel. Gabe, you're always welcome. <laughs> but I talk <laughs> a little bit about me, your work and, and let people know more about it. Yeah, sure. Um, so as Chance mentioned, it's called Symbolic Studies. That's my main project right now. And I basically follow each astrological sign and do my own decodes on the signs themselves. And so it's everything from like breaking down like the symbolism of the glyphs to uh, some of the mythology related to the signs. And uh, the whole project started out because I was illustrating these art pieces um, starting maybe like three years ago. I wanted to come out with my first series. And so I started illustrating all of the signs, my own interpretation of what I think they're all about. And then it just kind of evolved and snowballed into something else. And then now I'm doing everything that uh, you can check out on my YouTube. But I've learned a lot and I'm having a really, really great time with it. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, we're lucky to have you on the crew, man. We needed somebody like you. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. No, and you guys have been great, too. I mean, the stuff I've been learning from the whole crew has been really amazing. So it's a great fit for multiple reasons, I think. Absolutely. Now, there seems to always be like this, it'll probably be this way forever, a type of uh, numerical synchronicity with whatever number episode Vibrant happens to be. For example, I did a full moon dance party. <laughs> that was really fun on number 18, which is the moon. Although I do have suspicions that maybe the moon should be 19 and the sun should be 18. That's a different story. <laughs> but tonight we're on episode 26, which is the Tetragrammaton, the Yadve. Yad yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, Y H V H. Yad Hey Vav Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I was losing my words there. But that's a really interesting subject that correlates nicely with some of Gabriel's recent content. And I thought maybe we could just start digging into that and show us your new cipher that 
totally blows my mind. This is why you're such a valuable uh, mind, Gabriel, that you are deciphering these things in real time and demonstrating that even if nobody else has ever created these links, it exists because the whole system is holistic, A to Z. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. anyway, do you want to you wanna describe this work a little bit? Sure. So uh, the, the thing that, that kind of introduced me into these ideas is uh, I learned that all of the dollar bills, one through 100, add up to 188. And I thought that's kind of nifty. That's, uh, you know, that's the caduceus staff. That's the two snakes winding up the one when you stack 188. And then I uh, started to see that number everywhere. You know, that gets people when they start seeing numbers everywhere, it kind of leads them down a path. So then I uh, took the word standards and I did added up all the numbers of the word standards. And I got, I believe I got 81. So it wasn't the same thing, but it was very similar. Um, and then I was looking at the word standards and I realized that if you take first, second, and third, and you take the letters from the, one S T two N D three R D you get standard S T N D R D standard. So I just started like taking all things that are standards and overlapping them onto one another uh, because that's where, um, where information is hidden in plain sight. It's called uh, steganography and it's where they uh, codes can be put in the public purview, but if people don't have the key, they can't unlock the code. So that's kind of my line of thinking when I started to just take all the things that everybody knows and layer them on top of each other and try to find uh, symbols, significance. Uh, and so what I have here is my uh, Diction of Aries cipher. And... Thank you. Yep. And you can see I have basically started the alphabet on the pagan holiday over here and wrapped it around the zodiac. Uh, 260 degrees for English. Uh, modern day Hebrew has 27 letters to it. Um, so I put the ampersand down there. Uh, but the beautiful thing about the these markations of these degrees of these angles, it gives you the gematrological value of the letters. Uh, but it also turns out that is a nine-month birthing cycle, it, just under nine months. And nine months is the uh, standard for a child to be born. And that's when I knew I was looking at something very significant and that ideas could be born out of this gateway of information. And sure enough, uh, the more I look at it, the more I ponder its significance, uh, the more I have come to uh, see that I think somebody else may have done this in the past. You know, uh, I don't, I, I always think of Sir Francis Bacon probably maybe goes back to the Greeks, you know, uh, but it would be, the other thing is, it would be cross-cultural because the alphabet, the order of the alphabet tends to be a standard throughout time and cultures. And so it's very likely that uh, some semblance of this arrangement uh, has been used in, you know, uh, Chaldean, uh, Greek, you know, these phonetics, they follow this alphabetic order uh, in other cultures as well. So I started with the pagan new year where we, you know, we break where the sprouts break through the earth. Vernal and, equinox, my birthday. Or, yeah, that's it. The equinox three, two, two, you got it. Yep. And uh, just wrapped it around. And I immediately saw very significant uh, patterns. For example, H I is, you know, the high point. This is the high point of the year up there uh, between June and July. 
And also for me, the R was very significant that it's at that 180 degree reversal point where the things start to return. And all words with R uh, are reflective. They're uh, repetition. Like the word R is very archetypal, archetypal <laughs> in its own right. Uh, so putting there's a lot of letters that are like, I mean, all the letters are really that way when you, when you start to see, <laughs> where you feel language like synesthetically. Yes. Think about words that begin with D and they tend to be divisive in some way. Yep. Yep. Uh, so I call this the Red Sea. This is the sea. It makes it the shape of the sea. Um, yeah, and uh, it also, I, I call it the Diction of Aries because when you do a Coptic cross, you go from the A to the R to the I to the Z. And uh, Sean was, you know, Sean made that classic joke about, uh, what is it, spectacles, what spectacles, testicles, what, wallet, wallet, wallet and watch. watch, something like that. I think it would be like, Spectacles, testicles, wallet, watch. I think that's how that would go. So uh, one other thing that has really blown my mind with this, I guess it, there's quite a few things, but the G to the H, uh, the, that is the symbol for Mercury. HG in the periodic table is Mercury. And we know that Mercury, the, the god, corresponds with the twins up here in this location. And I thought that was that's a beautiful thing. And so a G to the H, that's a seven to eight in uh, gamatri gamatria, uh, uh, ordinal reduced. And 78 is the number of cards in a tarot deck. And also when you put the G in the eight, you go from the letters into the numbers, you get a gate. G8 is a gateway. And here we are, we're going across a rite of passage with that summer solstice. And so in an incredibly appropriate way, I'm looking at Mercury guarding the gates. And I thought, that's really nifty, you know, and yeah, you, you can write that off as coincidence if you want. But then I keep looking and I come down here to the next gateway and I see the one six makes a seven and the one seven makes an eight. And wouldn't you know, I'm looking at a 78 at the gates again. And so could it be that it happens again down here? Sure is shit. 25 is a 7, 26 is an 8. Here we have three gates guarded by the HG of Mercury or the G8 because he goes both ways. He, he's, he's got that duplicitousness. And that was all fun and games. That was enough for me to be like, okay, that's that's beyond coincidence, right? But then I thought about Hermes Trismegistus. He's three times magnified. And when you multiply 78 times three, you get 234. And that is highly significant because we're told that is the axial tilt of the earth, 23.4 degrees. And our, our boy, uh, L.C. King, he was pointing out how Hermes up here in that, up near this, uh, the pole stars, he was pointing out how Hermes in some mythologies, he's holding up that pinnacle. He's the, holding the pole upon which all things rotate. And so the fact that when you thrice magnify 78, you get the axial tilt of the earth. And Hermes is said to be holding up that pinnacle, that tower, the eye in the sky that we talked about on Saturday. Things have just been coming together so fast. I feel like my brain's going to explode. Uh, so that's, a, that's just kind of scratching the surface. Uh, I did a couple of videos last week. And right in the middle of my videos, I was getting uploads and information coming at me and I had to do a two part video. Like you think I'm done. And then I come back in and I'm like, wait, there's more. <laughs> and so yeah, I feel like this is gonna, you just need to dedicate a whiteboard to just that. 
actually what would be cool is if we could crowdsource somebody out there that's handy in like adobe illustrator to recreate mm -hmm. that cipher in like really nice graphics and then we should all just get a poster of it <laughs> and uh, put it on the wall yeah yeah we could even do a start selling merch make t-shirts out of it sign <laughs> me up t-shirt ever i'm down <laughs> If you want to yeah. make that happen, we can totally do it. Oh, I think it would be well worthwhile. You know, we should, you know, put the work in the spiders, get the spiders. Like I, I was thinking uh, the weaving, uh, weaving of Aries cipher, W-O-A-C. What does that spell? Woke, woke. <laughs> w -O -A -C. But Gavin just threw out in the chat that to get to 100 or back to one, with two three point four, you need sixty six point six. <laughs> wow, that's a good catch there, buddy. Nice. Yeah, and backwards, of course. I think you said this in one of your videos. It's four thirty two, which is super crucial. There's yeah. so much to that cipher. Like that was just the bare minimum explanation. You did a really good job, actually. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it's hard to even know where to begin. Yeah, there is. There's so much in it, and. And one thing, and I have other, you know, ideas and ciphers that are original to me, but one of these days I'm going to find out Sir Francis Bacon wrote this in some secret book mm -hmm. and, and I'm just stumbling upon it like a, you know, like a rookie. I, and I'm rookie mistook my math and uh, Davin points out complimentary means it adds to 90 degrees or a right angle, which makes more sense now, <laughs> but ah. adding to nine, that's still like uh a completion in a sense because that's really the last digit still still heady yeah yeah gabe are you aware of the uh gate of the gods and gate of man correspondence with the zodiac with cancer and capricorn by chance is that something you've looked into no but the, it's uh oh, you're gonna blow my mind let me get it, my paper <laughs> Let me get my paper out. The, yeah, so a lot of chance has this too. We both have seven, like just riddled through our name and numerology. And don't you chance? Didn't you say you've got a lot of sevens? Yep. 322 adds to seven. 322, 1989, still seven because 1989 is a nine. My name, uh, uh -huh. two. So yep. yeah, I'm, I'm seven, seven, seven. Same. Nice. I'm, I'm full of sevens. Okay. What do you got with gate of the gods yeah so um there was this understanding and i believe it's babylonian in thought but it makes a ton of sense and then once you see it you kind of can't unsee it but uh the basic belief was that the gate of man was cancer and that we come through cancer and as you have in your cipher that's at the top right mm -hmm. and so um what's it called um in freemasonry where they have the, it's not the capstone, but it's like uh, on top of the arch. A lot of times there's this one stone that keystone. they have, the keystone, right? A lot of times that keystone has cancer in it. So there's Freemasonic art where it's just a keystone and yeah. it has the cancer symbol. And it's relating to this upper point of the Zodiac, right? Yeah. And so uh, their belief was that man comes through cancer and when you're thinking about cancer symbolism, you think of water and the womb and um, things of that sort. So, you know, when a woman gets pregnant, she has a baby bump, obviously, very motherly, very uh, moon-like, right? And so the belief was that we come through cancer, we kind of uh, incarnate through cancer, and then we exit through Capricorn. And so this is referred to as uh, the gate of man and the gate of the gods, essentially. And that these are the two points in the Zodiac that we come through and then leave out of. So we come through this upper sign and then we exit through Capricorn, which to me makes sense, too, because of its relationship with Saturn and the Earth and death and winter and all that kind of stuff. The symbolism makes a lot of sense. And when you look at some uh, Freemasonic tracing boards sometimes they'll have the keystone up top with cancer in it and then at the very bottom there's all this death symbolism or something like that right and so to me it's almost just a play on that as well so it's pretty interesting though nice. it makes a lot of sense gabriel do you happen to have a photo of the cipher handy i'll try i can try to dig one up and shoot it to you yep 
That would so just make it easier because then I can screen share it and pull it up and you don't have to hold that bad boy up. Good call. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, you know, one thing that uh, I always got a kick out of, I, one thing I find is so many times um, really profound revelatory information is hiding behind uh, jokes and things that people laugh at and they have this, uh, a, you know, a, an absurdity response. And they, uh, and for some reason, we have a tendency to look away or change the subject when things get funny or silly. But uh, I find that if you sit with it for a little longer, and I'm not saying like uh, to, to give up all your sense of humor, but if you just sit with it with a more serious tone, you'll see like really profound things come through the funniest jokes. And it's almost like we're, we're looking at truth and we don't want to look too long. And we have a knee-jerk uh, response to uh, pull away. And one example is like, do you guys remember Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure? Sure. Okay. So that moment when they see themselves in their, uh, their I guess it's their future self, gives them a question and says, what number are we thinking of? And they look at each other, they look back, and they're like, 69, bro. <laughs> that little joke, that little quip is so profound <laughs> because we have the twins looking at their themselves. They're looking at the twin of themselves from the past into the future. And what is the answer? Is 69, bro. And this is, they use the jewel eye the jewel of their eye to see the answer of, of cancer. And so I just, when I thought of that, I was like, is this the language of the muse speaking through the, the comedy writers of the story or are, or are they embedding meaning, you know? Sure. I, I, it's hard to tell. I'm going to send that picture to you, Chance. And hello, Zero. Saying hello in the background there. <laughs> so you're saying gem and I, that's what you're getting at? The, the gem, the gem in between your eyes. It's right. the, thir the, thir the jewel eye. I'm sorry. There, it's the jewel eye. But it's a gem and I, basically. Gem and I, it's gem and I, gem, right? Yes. Gotcha. Well, one thing you pointed out regarding the 6 9 of Cancer too the other day was that um, I believe you said that it's symbolic of the dippers as well around the pole star. Yeah. Yeah. I had never really considered that to be honest, but that makes perfect sense. Isn't that so profound? And how, yeah. Is, yeah. Is there um, more to that? Like what makes it symbolic of Ursa major? Yeah. I mean, uh, to me, it, it even kind of looks like the dippers in a way where you have the handle of the dipper and then you have the vessel component and then um polaris the pole star which is what the dippers revolve around right and so it's this constant rotation it's this constant churning and um anything that really spins even like the swastika or the pinwheel or i know um gabe you brought up the mill the other day you know it's all the same symbolism you yes. know, so there's like endless symbols that have like this central axis and everything's rotating around it. And in my opinion, it really goes back to um, the axis Mundi, the world axis, the pole star, Ursa Major and Minor, this churning yeah. of the heavens, you know. Right. And, you know, I listened to our uh, episode 65 and I misspoke. I think I was saying the bloodline of Solomon, but it would have been S Samson. It would be oh. Samson who ended up blind working on the on the mill. The oh, mill okay. Stone. So I, I had a little, I always get those two switched. But Chance, I sent you a graphic I made today, totally inspired by you, Mario. I learned awesome. this from watching you, man. But this <laughs> is this is mm. giving that visual, and you see I tipped the seven and highlighted it because it is a seven. And you call this the ads tool, right? Yeah, A D Z E. I could be saying it wrong, but that's how it's spelled at least. So profound. Wow, I love that man. That's great. Yes, uh, and also, um, 
in the Crowley uh, tarot deck, which it's so funny. I just cracked that thing open like a few days before you came on the weave with us. And it's like you're filling in blanks. And it's like I'm just bathing in the the bath of gnosis. Of the, aqua uh, the Aquarian gnosis is pouring over me. Um, but there's uh, the, the Emperor card has uh, Tzedi is the Hebrew symbol on that card. And it's just a little off. Uh, the, he's in uh, Aries, the Emperor card. He's just a little to the one side. But when you said that ADZ, uh, I thought of that symbol, that Hebrew symbol, uh, T-Z-A-D-D-I. Uh, they're just very similar. Um, Look out. Hey, Elsie King. <laughs> Hi. How you going? Hey there. Greetings. Good, man. Uh, I thought yeah. I'd pop on for a quick uh, chat. Yeah, this is exactly what we needed. We've been going deep on uh, Gabriel's new cipher. I don't know if you got a chance to check this out. Yeah, I have. It's great. <laughs> it's great. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> it yeah, has, has this sparked anything uh, in your thought thinking process or connected to some of the the big number crunching you've been doing lately? And welcome. Welcome, LC King. Check out LC King on YouTube. I'll link that up after the screen share in the chat. Yeah. Um, no, I just it, it's interesting, especially when you're talking about the number um, like 26 and 27. And that's what I've been sort of focusing on. And um, what I was really looking for was this sort of connection between the luminaries and um, how the numbers sort of interlink. And basically the, the story they give us is, you know, each of these luminaries are doing their own thing in their own time and we can't work it out. And, you know, looking at the older uh, number systems and, and just how they went about things, they, they had integration between a lot of the um, uh, sort of measurement systems and everything was interlinked. And so what I was looking for is like um, that same interlinked sort of stuff in regards to the luminaries. And so that's why the um, 26 and 27 sort of popped up because that was the, the main number that actually uh, brought all these different things together. But we can go into that a bit later. I don't want to ramble on. Yeah, we're on episode 26 of Vibrant, so that it's good yeah. to talk 26. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, Snake Jones, big up Snake, if you're watching, he introduced me to you, LC King, kind of brought mm -hmm. me over to your channel, and uh, it's just amazing how in stride uh, you and I were. You, you know, you were working on that lunar standstill, and uh, and Chance and I had been really talking about the, you know, that uh, 18 and the 19 are the sun pillar and the moon pillar. I guess moon is 18, sun is 19. We're thinking there might be that switcheroo, but uh, regardless, the, the hidden jewel in between those two cards, as you know, is that lunar standstill at the 18.6. Uh, is that right? Yeah, that's the 18.6. Um, that's in, you know, years as we have them now, but there's, there's a bit of a question that I've been looking at and that's to do with, um, you know, how long is our actual year and through this sort of little rabbit hole that I've been working down, it's, it's looking more and more like, uh, 364 days rather than the 365, which is really, really interesting. Very I just want to hear all three of you talk. I'm, I'm, in, I'm in the <laughs> audience. <laughs> okay. So, Gabe, I noticed on your cipher, um, you mm -hmm. have the. Uh, I always, I, don't, I can't remember if it's the Chiro or Cairo, right? The P and the X. Yes. Yeah. Uh, why do you have that there? Because I'm kind of interested in the P right now, kind of related to what you were saying, Chance. I was just reading in one of my reference books today, and so many of the words that started with P in the section that I was at. Are completely related so i was looking at polar and pole and pillar and post and point and then i just started thinking about the p and i'm like i bet gabe has something to say about the p i hope so at least <laughs> well 
Can, uh, so you see that it's pointing at the uh, the Virgin, the Virgo. And uh, one of my just nifty little facts, you know, Virgo is a uh, anagram for vigor. And I would say uh, a modern day interpretation of this is that the, uh, so both generative organs are spelled with a P. You know, you've got the, the yoni and you got the phallus. Mm. They, you know, just to keep it clean, keep it PG. <laughs> uh, but the pole and the hole. The pole and the hole. Here it is. So, yep. so in Kundalini practice, you know, uh, remaining abstinent or, you know, keeping that vigor, that vitality is a form of filling up your cup. Uh, and so having the P pointing at the Virgo is, to me, an indication of uh, building up one of my favorite magical terms, Parthenia. And Parthenia is virginity. It's also anticipation. And um, for me, so many things like, uh, like when we're going to do a show, so much of the joy is in the anticipation of doing the show. And when the show is over, I'm always like, oh, man, it's over, <laughs> you know? So and, I, and another thing that I just learned a couple days ago from uh, Big Up to uh, Mark Steves on uh, My Family Thinks I'm Crazy, he just dropped very quickly with Christopher, Christopher Knowles. He mentioned that the word ceremony it hails back to a Roman goddess named Ceres. And this is where like Ceri, serial killer, serial, Ceri, uh, well, she is the goddess of the harvest. And so your cereal is a grain, is a bunch of grains. So you're partaking of the harvest, you're taking it in. But what, what it also told me is that the ceremony, the ritual is not where the work is done. The ceremony and the ritual is the end of it all. And it's all about the preparation that went into preparing that moment of execution. So the ceremony is actually the, you know, it's the big release. Uh, it's the point of no turning back. But all of the real magic is, uh, is done in preparation. So here we have preparation, prepare, parthenia. The poles and the holes, all pointing at the Virgo, and so um, the the P needs to be prepared before it can <laughs> work too. It has to, it has to be ready to go. Before, I I didn't mean to cut in, but now that I already am going, I yeah. want to point out too. It's got the O, which is the hole. It's got the P, which is the the phallus, and it's got the Q, which is that going in there. You probably already <laughs> noticed. That. Now Great the call. other thing about ceremony, ceremony, cere ceremony, <laughs> it's cer. You could link it to Saraswati as well, or Abraham's Sarah, but also you've got uh, the Moni part or Mooney. And what you do with your harvest is you exchange it for money so that you have the money to survive through the gate and the gate of winter. And uh, what else pertains to harvests and crops? Your crops are going to do way better if you understand what moon phase to plant and what moon phase to harvest. You're going to get more money if you're on the Mooney. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. That's so beautiful. So yeah. And, and Virgo, you know, she relates to, I think it was in older Babylonian, but it was, uh, she relates to the frond as well, which is part of the date palm. So there's this reference to fingers and measurement systems in, in the, the hand, as well as, um, yeah, the, the actual, the date palm, I forget the proper name for it, but it, it's, it's got something to do with the Phoenix as well. So rising again. So, um, nice. so yeah, Virgo was, you know, not one sign in a sense, but two, um, the frond and the furrow. So one was for yeah. sort of putting the seeds into the ground and the other one was harvesting the dates or the, the fruits as you were talking about. That's great. And also um, if you're harvesting and you're doing commerce, you need to measure everything. 
And weights and measures comes with Libra, which is where we get like the LB for pound, Libra Pondo, right. and all this crazy measurement stuff having to do with industry and what have you comes directly from Libra, basically. Even um, the barley grain was a, a measurement in itself. So oh, yeah. uh, as a, a piece of length or even as a weight. So they, they're interrelated. Yeah. There's so much with the word bar, that phonetic beginning to barley, that I find, you know, very, very interesting how that then connects us to like the earth sign pertaining to physical resources that come to the earth, but also your money. Mm -hmm. And I, I brought this up on the last weave, but Hera whose sacred animals are the bull and the lion <laughs> and the peacock. But Hera sounds like Sarah. It's a very, very mm. uh, sh small phonetic shift. And she wears the, <clears throat> she wears the, the fortress crown, right? which is very connected to Kronos, where you get the corn root, the K-R-N, which is a seed or yes. a kernel. Yes. Uh, and so another point, uh, this one was from Tom Carberry, but so we're penetrating through past the bar, past the barrier. And, you know, some people could say that, you know, the female uh, anatomical phenomenon that is represented by the virgin is a, a barrier, a membrane, uh, the, the hymen, so to say. And so once we pass the state of virginity, we move into the Libra. And uh, one of there's so many words, um, you know, lips, you're the lips like kissing, but there's also other lips that they're talking about. But Tom Carberry, he pointed out the term lubricious and lubricious is generally reserved for uh, the for to refer to a, a woman who is very liberal with her sexuality. Um, Licentious but, means that, too. Yes. In, in license, the original definition of license was lawless, actually. You got a license to do something that would otherwise be lawless. Yes. So there's yes. more L going in there. Yeah. So when he said lubricious and he, you know, he just was just bringing up the example of a lubricious woman. I thought, oh, that's really, you know, that's that's cute. But it also means it has to do with uh, oil, like you lubricate the gears, and that's a very sexual component as well. Um, but there's more to it um, in a really fine, nuanced way. It, a person who is lubricious is quick to say yes. So you've, you know, you've greased the wheels, and now the deal can be done in expediently. And this is where I'm having a big revelation on Aleister Crowley switching the uh, the Justice card in that location and the Lion card, because, which he then called Lust, with which the L he then called strength. Lust. Yes, and I can't help and, but notice in the cipher too that Libra begins at the point where there's this L. It starts uh, if you uh, can make an L right there. Sweet. And L is on the Leo up above. Yeah, little Leo. Oh, there's like a Leo major and a Leo minor kind of built into what you just said right there. Yeah, and the lion, Leo, has got the L and the N, two of the letters of Leo or lion <laughs> on your cipher right there. Yes. And, you know, you lubricate mm. in Libra to prepare for the, the sexual act in Scorpio. Right. The penetration point. It's so profound. Yeah. There's also uh, and then the firing of the shot in Sagittarius. <laughs> yeah. Uh. yeah, it's all so very sexual, isn't it? Yeah, that's yes. what makes it reflective of, of life, I guess. Life is sexy. Mm hmm. Yeah. So uh, I guess I could bring forward my my grand revelation. Uh, I, I'm, I think you saw it. Did you see the Ophiuchus breakdown that I did, Chance? With the cipher? Yes. Yeah. I've seen everything that hasn't been put up today, if there's anything new today. All right. Yeah. I'm all caught up. So I'll, I'll just drop it here. If anybody hasn't seen it, they can go back and watch me fumble through my my discovery because uh, it was kind of cumbersome and 
uh, very candid. It happened <laughs> uh, live and direct. I realized that OPQ, the week before I was doing this video, we were fo focusing on ophiolatry, and that is the worship of snakes. And so it was fresh on my mind. And uh, Ophiuchus is uh, standing, his one foot is standing on the tail of the Scorpio. And so uh, can you bring it back up, Chance? Yeah, nice. So I realized that, um, so Elsie, you remember uh, I had a big breakthrough with RST representing the mm -hmm. lunar still and how R is number 18, S is number 19. So we have the lunar is the 18, the solar is 19. And right in between them at that balancing point of the scales, the tipping point of the scales, Right there is the lunar standstill mark of 18.6, as they as we are told. And so that is a tipping point. It's like a crucial tipping point. It's a, the resting point of those scales. So uh, from there, I moved into the T, U, and the V, which T, U, V reduces to a 2, 3, 4. And that's the 223.4 axial tilt of the earth. It's also uh, tav in Hebrew means foot. Uh, if you say V-U-T in reverse, because Hebrew is written in reverse, so you say V-U-T and you get vut. So it makes perfect sense to me that a T-U-V means foot in Hebrew because it is pronounced vut when you reverse it. So we have a resting and a vut. And I was almost done with my video when I when I just kind of looked at it from a further perspective, and I realized OPQ is Ophiuchus, and he is RST resting his vut TUV right in between the V and the W on the tail of Scorpion. And what is the only letter that stands out when you say the alphabet? All the letters except for one letter. All of them are single syllables. There's only one letter that is three syllables long. W. w. It stands out like a sore foot. <laughs> <laughs> now, now that I know what I'm looking at, Ophiuchus is resting his foot on the W. And it was only a night before this revelation, I was listening to... Um, the worm, W. Worm. Yes, yes. And uh, I was listening to uh, David Matheson on Rising from the Ashes, and they were going in real deep on Ophiuchus. And they were talking about how Ophiuchus is like this interchangeable, mysterious, an enigmatic uh, constellation. And they were saying it could be Moses, it could be Jesus, it could be all these, you know, divine mythological characters interchangeably but he matheson was even saying it could be your higher self representing your higher self and then the next day i'm looking at the double of you ophiuchus is on the double of you and so uh that was that was pretty next level profound to me that all the this information is just coming together enough to kind of steer my thinking into realizing that and then things get really weird when you take this cipher and you put it on my territories and the Ophiuchus on the United States map is right on the Georgia Guidestones. Wow. Yeah. I'm going to well, shut up. I'm going to shut no, up. No, that's interesting, man. I love all of this. Um, <laughs> but when I was looking into Ophiuchus several months ago, so my information's kind of rusty, I got a really strong sense that, um, it might be a metaphor having to do with the pole star. And so sometimes Ophiuchus is called the central sign, right? And it would be the 13th sign. And I was really amazed to find some Zodiac graphics, not too many, but there's a few out there, where instead of the sun being in the middle of the Zodiac wheel, which is common for some artistic renditions, you know, mm -hmm. it was actually Ophiuchus that was in the center of the wheel, the hub of the wheel, just like Polaris. 
you know, and also the other thing is when you're looking towards Ophiuchus in the night sky, you're looking towards galactic center. You're looking towards, my understanding is you're looking towards the galactic center, which I think is really interesting too. And goes back to the whole central sign sort of business. Yes. And uh, it planetarily is, does it correspond with Mercury, Ophiuchus? Do you know? Yeah, to a degree, because it has uh, the staff and the, it's related to what is it the um the healer so oh, with Kyla. the single staff and there's in the snake yeah so yeah, yeah but exactly. I, i'm with you with all, with all the it all relates back to that central um central figure mm -hmm. which is in a sense it's a, a trinity in itself and yeah it's the it's the pole the, the everything wheels around so yeah, the thirteenth sign, basically. Yep. And and yep. each of those, uh, each of the signs are a manifestation of that singular one sign. Basically, it's it's just in its different elements, and so it sort of can relate to, depending on, you know, I look at it like the the backdrop of a clock, you know, the face of the clock, and you've got the hands moving around. So that's it's giving you the Trinity because it's it's giving you um, past, present, and future. And so, you know, you can have the sun and moon both incorporated in, in that as the minute hand and the, you know, the hour hand. But it's that central placement on the backdrop that gives you the time in a sense. So, yeah, that's, that's, that's just how I see it. The whole thing with ophiolatry is that the serpent symbolism is veiled solar symbolism. So putting Ophiuchus in the middle, the 13 is the one that the 12 move around. That makes perfect sense. It's the the Christ with 12 disciples. It's the the King Arthur who was the, the bear of England, right? The mm -hmm. Ursa Major that rotates around the pole star. And even right around the pole star too, you have that Draco constellation, which is a huge serpent constellation. Yep, exactly. Yeah, well, that's right. It's, yeah, it's it's Jesus, it's Vishnu, it's Buddha. Um, all of them have that symbolic uh, reference to that that midpoint that everything moves around from, and that's where you base time from. It's from the the stars. You know, LC, what you just said is the Trinity. So when you go, Cha, Fuan, you got mm. that on the W. The trifecta triangle, the triforce. And a trapezoid, too, which has got all kinds of occult significance. Sir Francis Bacon started the secret order of the trapezoid. Really? Mm hmm. It's been around that long. Yeah. Francis Bacon, man. Oh, it all. I. I want to interrogate him. I don't want to talk yeah. to him. I want to tie him down. I want to shake him and just turn him upside down and get everything he knows. LC, um, I'm not familiar with your work, but uh, I'm loving what you're putting out there. May I ask if you're uh, a geocentrist or if you have an opinion on geocentrism versus heliocentrism? <laughs> no, it's flat, mate. <laughs> flat as fuck yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's pretty much what, what all my videos are about oh, basically yeah, okay. what i do yeah what i do is um yeah it, it's, a, it's a bit of a long story but what i found was that there's a relationship between a battery and how our world works so and it sort of incorporates that four elements and and those sort of things. So basically, all I did, all I've been doing is applying the principles of a battery to our world. And um, yeah, there's nice. some really significant correspondences. Uh, yeah, they they just don't even stop. More and more keeps coming. You're on to something. No. Yeah. That that entire notion has totally helped me in so many ways. Uh, talking to you and Ben. And the insights relating to that just keep flashing. That's why I think I'm onto something, or you guys are onto something. We're onto something. It, uh, it's a really amazing yeah, group yeah. effort. Yeah, it is. It's it's brilliant. And I just put stuff out so people can consider it and um, you know make up their own minds. And it's just stuff that I find. But um, you know, it, 
in the battery itself, it shows the Trinity as well at play, this, this mechanism for um, energy. You know, it's got this one side's a positive terminal, one side's a negative terminal, and then there's a connection between the two. And so when I view the world from that perspective of energy creation, you've got the sun, the moon, and then that backdrop or that connection, the air or, you know, the Jupiter and the old is basically the um, connection between the two. And so that's the same as that you would see the Trinity in a sense as sun, moon, and the stars. So, yeah, it's just just some re really interesting correlations on how it all pieces together. And it, it really does give a, a very nice um, way of looking at the world and um, something quite holistic, actually. Sure. Is uh, Are you referring to a toroidal battery or something else? Well, it's just some, basically I've really just focused on the main components of a battery and then applying them. Um, and yeah, I think the, the toroidal um, concept is extremely valid. Um, sure. So, yeah. And I just uh, also from this work, you know, you start to see that it's an enclosed system, that it germinated from within itself and expanded exactly. in a sense. Um, so you get a lot of these different concepts that are just very natural because when you're looking at energy, um, what you're looking at is, you know, how we work, how plants work, how everything works. And if you're getting down to the fundamentals, which is electrochemistry, that's just the way the world does work. So all I'm doing is applying it to a, on a bigger level and, you know, trying my best to anyway. That's what's so beautiful about it. That's the, to me, that's the ring of truth when you can apply the self similarity across scales that all life shares. We'll, we'll get Gabe yeah. on, on our side. He's, he likes to play the middle. <laughs> I do. I play the middle. No, we don't have sides. We're all here on team life affirming truth. Mm -hmm. And even yeah. the, even the mythology of the NASA and the, jpl's out there <laughs> they they also see truth in that too if you can decipher it right yeah exactly you know there's a term that the uh that the germans used to use in their propaganda they used to use this word uh welt anschauenskrieg and it's a you know it's a 20 dollar word like the germans love and it means worldview warfare and uh it you know at first glance you're like oh it means you know if walt disney can convince everybody that uh that being an orphan is is cool then that'll make people disavow their parents or you know break up the family but there's a i i like to look at it in multiple from multiple lenses you know i also think that they might be saying that Anybody who has a full perspective on the world can potentially influence the world. And so the concept of taking the world in in a single glance, for one, even in the globe uh, paradigm, it's not possible because you would still be only seeing half of the globe. There's a dark side, the side you can't see. So it is in the globe. It's impossible to have a holistic worldview. Um, and that could be part of the uh, controlling uh, what could be a very powerful perspective to hold it all in one glance. And so I just like to point out that if it is flat, then we would be able to see it in a single glance or see all there is to see from one location and that would be a very powerful perspective for the masses to hold and, and so the pole star would have that perspective would the see pole it. star has it i've never thought about that before but yeah we live in the duality we only see 180 degrees but we know or some of us know from training other faculties of our senses and meditation practices that it is possible to see in 360 degrees and what you just said is so profound that the, the globe Earth cuts the world in two uh, across whatever axis you want. <laughs> Hemispheres, right. they call it. That's that's astounding. That's a really good point.
Yes, but anyway, sir. about the meditation thing, what I mean is that like when sitting in meditation, sometimes I can see the whole room with my eyes closed. So it's a thing. Yeah. I know other people have further developed abilities than that. I'm a, a newbie at it. I'm not a newbie, but I'm a, I'm a, I'm a white belt though. <laughs> uh, speaking of the world <laughs> and the globe, oh, oh, go ahead, Elsie. No, no, go for it. Yep. <laughs> Um, cause I was looking into it. I was curious recently. I'm like so many world religions, in my opinion, when I really start analyzing the symbolism, I'm seeing a lot of pole star Northern based myths basically being told and I'll see kind of what you said. It's like, um, you know, the Zodiac is an emanation of, of one thing in just different ways. Right. And so what I'm seeing with the uh global although i try not to use that word mythology is that it's all emanations of the same thing and so i think because a lot of ancient cultures they believed we came from the north and returned to the north and the north star or whatever was the north star at the time because it changes with procession was a really really big deal to them and so i wanted to find out i'm like how many cultures around the world can actually see the pole star and it's 90% of the Earth's population can see the pole star. And so, and this includes like, you know, India and China and of course Europe and everything else. So it's like most of the mythology that people are familiar with, they uh, had a visible link to that part of the sky. They can actually see it for themselves, which I think is interesting. To get back to like the the meditation type thing, when you're looking at the pole star at a lot of these um, religions, and especially um, Buddhism is or zazen and those type of um, ones, they they're concentrating on being in the present moment. So they're pr they're concentrating on being the preserver of the Trinity. So that midpoint between the two polarities, you know, the the point between sun and moon, your you know the devil and the angel on each shoulder that's that's where you are and the spine is basically the world tree and so the the top of the head or where polaris is is sort of you know and i've read some sort of strange meditation books in a sense and and that's where they sort of move that energy up and out through the top of the head to to leave as a, a way of getting in and out of the body or um, that's what you do when you die, basically. So um, there's there's an interesting correspondence there, but it's also about that um, being centered within yourself, um, you know, understanding that it's not one thing or the other or, yeah, those sort of concepts come into play when you relate those stories, not just as a world dynamic, but also as a meditative practice. So there's a one-to-one -one relationship there exactly exactly and so to me it really seems like um we've been given a lot of solar myths to create a solar psychology versus a polar psychology you know and so in a lot of ways i think uh the what the flip that's happened over the ages and i don't know when this happened or what have you i don't claim to really know but it seems as though um, you know, we're taught obviously about the solar system, but we're not taught about the polar system, you know, and I think that in actuality, we may live in a polar system, not a solar system. And that's one of the great flips, you know. The other interesting thing that comes out when you look at the battery is um, the the moon basically gives the sun power. So it's that there is a real sort of profound sort of change in mentality when you look at the moon like that as the the giver of the the power to the sun that then does a, a bunch of different actions that then give the power back to the moon in a sense so there's this cyclic action happening but um it really does start to paint a, a different picture of the moon as a power source not just as you know this rock floating through space or whatever you know right right and that's the thing that really bothers me to be honest is the uh solar um cosmology sort of outlook and the the fact that the the sun takes so much prominence um is that you know uh with it comes a lot of ideas about everything being dead and everything right. being separate and nothing nothing matters seemingly you know so you talk to anyone who's a nasa fanboy 
And generally, that's going to be their perspective. Well, it's atheistic. Heliocentrism, in, it's, it's the cult of hell or yeah, hell. Yeah. In, in Greek, Helios would be Elios. They were right. the Hellenes or the Elenes. And that's the angel of death or El. Right. Which is the sun in winter. So, I mean, whenever we apply this daemon of many names to the concepts we're talking about, that it's all one character that the entire zodiac radiates or emanates from. You know, I'm going to I'm going to give up some of my goods on my next video. I can't mm -hmm. I just can't hold it in. Please. So, uh, a after talking to you, Mario, uh, I you know, I've been having these just little tiny revelations and they add up to like really good stuff. But like I was thinking about North Star and North Star is a NS. Um, and in uh, septenary, NS is a one six. And that's your 16th tower card. And we were talking about how the tower card is kind of is pointing to that columnal polar uh, pillar alignment. But in my uh, next video, which is going to take me a while to put together, so I'll just spill the beans on it. Um, I have corresponded Anubis, the jackal-headed... Uh, God of the underworld with Saturn in a major way. And I don't get that credit. Other people have done that <clears throat> way before me. But the uh, there, the indicators of that correspondence is uh, it's pretty heavy duty stuff. And in uh, one reason why Anubis, why in if you take that Egyptian and you put it with Emmanuel Velikovsky's idea of Saturn sitting up on that North Pole, Saturn has gone into a fall and is literally down in the underworld now and now has dominion over, over the realm of the dead. And that kind of fills in this idea that we're talking about with uh, Helios and hell in this death cult. You know, um, Troy McLaughlin has that Saturnian death cult thing, which I really love his work. Well, this is where it gets really cool. This is so cool, Mario. Pointing back to the ads tool. Anubis has a nickname. And Anubis's nickname is he who is at the place of embalming. And he who is at the place of embalming is pointing, indicating up here with these ads tools, right? And what is the whole world doing to make sure that they're that they're terrified right now they're going through a ritual of embalming of embalming with the swabs and so people have no idea that that ritual test that they're doing is enjoining them with this death cult this saturnian death cult and uh the power and the significance of that is it, it's i mean it can be scary for a lot of people i'm fascinated by it uh, but I also have like a knee jerk uh, resistance to it where I'm like, nah, fuck the death cult <laughs> down with the death cult, uh, which I think is by design to a large degree. But I just think that's really something that the embalming in the ads tool uh, points to Velikovsky's work in a major way. About Anubis too, something interesting. One of his other appellations is Latrator Anubis, which in Latin Latrator means barker. So there's the word bar again. <laughs> wow. he's, the, he's the guardian of the visible horizon and the solstices. But the, the barker appellation has probably to do with some serious connections. The dog star, which yes. is very important to the cult of hell. Yes. Which I, I, I don't, I admit, I don't fully understand that. Yeah. A uh, serious connection. Uh, yeah, I was actually uh, looking into bar recently because I saw so much Aquarius symbolism in the bar scene, actually. And uh, that's where bar comes from barrier, the French word for barrier, because you're separating the bartender and then the crowds who are coming to get their drink and everything else. And then, of course, they're drinking and, uh, you know, liquor can be called spirits. 
And that's one of the ideas behind Aquarius. There you go. You know, um, the water that's being poured from the urn can be looked at in multiple different ways, including ether and electricity and even currents of air, too. So there's many ways of looking at it. Um, but I think there's a lot of Aquarius, Aquarian symbolism uh, within the idea of the bar, too, and the community sort of aspect, which is like an Aquarian sort of concept and everything, people coming together. And then I kind of went on this deep dive about how important taverns and bars and pubs were in history, basically, and how many important meetings and, and everything, how many people met each other and how many works were like developed in this whole network and everything. And I just have like a whole newfound appreciation for it. Um, and that started because apparently Aquarius, um, according to some people, was called a skinker. And I guess this is like an old timey word for um, liquor pourer, basically, essentially bartender, Whoa. which I think is interesting. Yeah. How, how Just do you think th about how this cult is connected to the, the ale houses yeah. and they are still relevant to the houses where you go when you have ailments, the hospitals, mm. the ale house. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. You know what's what's interesting about beer? I saw a video a fair while ago now, but um, they didn't always have the hops in them, which was basically um, the the people that would pick it would get brewers droop. So you know it had that estrogen type thing. It was actually the they brought that sort of in in the eighteen hundreds or maybe even um, later than that. But before that, it was actually beer was made with. Um, lots of different herbs and it was actually not something that sort of sedated you but it actually pepped you up and had a it was basically a, a drink that had alcohol in it but it also um had a, a different qualities you could make many many different types and a lot of these things but rarely did they use hops as that sedative and sort of um that quality to it you know Feminizing. so i just found that fascinating and then they brought that in as a blanket rule over everything and said you have to make it this way wow yeah you know, exactly da davin dropped this in the vibrant call in line like 45 minutes ago he was ahead of the conversation psychically the astrology of beer <laughs> <laughs> nice uranus <laughs> brew your own beer neptune i don't remember how many beers saturn put down that beer Jupiter, I'm going out tonight. Where's the beer? Mars, I just slammed a whole can of beer. Venus, I love a good craft beer. Mercury, I know we, where we can get beer. Pluto, hold my beer. <laughs> so nice one, Davin. It's, I guess you knew where we were going with this. Wow. Very psychic. Nice. That's awesome. I love that. So uh, how did you spell skinker? Uh, my understanding, if I'm recalling it correctly, it's S K I N K E R. Okay. So I, uh, I have always found it fascinating that the word bar means initiation, you know, a barrier, you're crossing a line and Tav as in Tav also is, I think of that as an initiation, um, because, and that's a tavern. And when you're at the tavern, you're at the bar. And so these are both uh, very just interesting corresponding points of initiation uh, to think about. Um, so uh, Tav is the last, Tav is the last letter in the old Hebrew alphabet, back when it was 22 letters long. It was the last letter. But uh, I've pointed this out before, we read it in reverse. So from the English perspective, it would be the first letter for us and uh, then, okay well that that sort of makes sense for aquarius in a sense because oh, nice. you know i've been looking at the zodiac in a different way which is basically um how you would do it if you were a farmer or something like that so you'd get up early in the morning before sunrise and then see what sign is actually leading the um month in or the day in right yes. and then in the evening you would have a different sign depending on what's following the sun. And that would actually give you where the sun is between those two signs. So one sign would be the rising sign in the east, um, the living sign in a sense, and the westing sign would be the death sign. So if you look at um, 
you say the the spring equinox you would see aquarius would be rising before the sun and so that would be your equinox sign that brings in the sun the herald in a sense and it's interesting as well when you look at your cipher that that man if you follow that man all the way through he actually sort of dies because there's two signs where he dies and he'll die in those two months or you know right. and then re-rise again later on at the spring equinox but yeah. um so the the actual um uh what's it called the the aries um that sort of tropical zodiac is looking at the the sun or what follows the sun in the evening uh -huh. so at the equinox in a sense um the aries would be dying or would be going to the west so this is like the passover lamb or or whatever it is you know the, yeah. i'm still working on a bunch of this stuff but it's it basically gives you three signs to work with a trinity of signs that tell you where the sun is in actuality because you can't see it when it's in the daytime uh -huh. but or the morning or the evening sign so it really really interesting because if if that's how that they were doing it in the past then it sort of uh, disproves this idea of procession and i think that's a big that's a critical sort of key to this whole uh mess we're in in a sense nice yeah that's my point. I, I love the trinity that the trinity keeps coming up that that's like a keystone for you that's 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 crucial i always think about like alphabet agencies are always three letters long you know your name is the first middle last moses had to go see the pharaoh three times they've got this whole thing it's the uh alchemical salt mercury and sulfur uh yeah michael that, Wan was just he, he just was talking about how he uh went to go give us a, a talk at a Freemasonic gathering. And they straight up told him that we're going to make three offers to you. You might not know what they are, but that's how it'll determine whether or not you join us, <laughs> how you react to those offers. And so he's probably like, uh, I hope I don't. Uh, I reacted the affirmative accidentally. <laughs> I don't think he wants to join. That's some wild stuff, though. People should look into uh, the newest episode of Handbook for the Apocalypse your handbook for the apocalypse on the Susquehanna alchemy or my family thinks I'm crazy feed. Very interesting. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. And my favorite part was that he straight up asked, asked the Masons if they had any malefic intent for him. And they're like, we wouldn't tell you if we did. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, everything yeah, is visible by three. Yeah. Know? Yeah. The Trinity just sort of shows up and it really only, sort of became prominent to me as a, as a, an expression of energy mm -hmm. because you'd need those positive and negative and the communication between them to actually get energy to move yeah man. and so it has to be there encoded in everything because it is an expression of how energy works so the same as the um when you look at a flow battery when you look at um, a thermo galvanic battery which is you'll have one side's hot one side's cold and then all of a sudden you're getting energy flowing across so it it's just that principle of energy and then that is your basis and then it moves you know to everything else yeah i point it out all the time but numerically are even the number sequence from one to infinity is trinity's repeating all the way through in theosophical addition which is the four is a one one two three four equals ten which is one and it goes on seven if you add all the digits together you get the 28 reduces to one 10 is obviously one so it's one two three four five one <laughs> i'm sorry one two three one five six one eight nine one eleven twelve one fourteen fifteen and so on and there's a very interesting way of laying out that sequence that actually creates the original hebrew alphabet one to twenty two which is in the it's detailed in the July's End audiobook, uh, but it's kind of a visual thing. I might bring that image up actually because it's pretty cool. Yeah, I'd love to see it. So, real quick point, you know, we're talking about the T A V, that's the one three letters, and the B A R is three letters. It's got that A, that initiation in the middle, the vowel, the sacred vowel 
that binds the binding vowel. But bar is it's also the first word, first syllable in the Hebrew Bible. And what is what are those two Ursa Majora and Ursa Minora? Ursa they're, Major and Minor, yeah. Yeah. They're the bear stars. Yes. So even the Hebrew Bible start is reckoning. It recognizes. Reckoning means to recrown, to put your crown back on and get your bearings on mm. what direction to go. And it all points to that those bear stars as an initiation point, big time. Amazing. Yeah. So if you look at the image I just pulled up, you can draw this at home to get a sense for it. But you would start with a, a cross, which is a tau or tav. And you would write the yod, he, vav, he, counterclockwise around it, because Hebrew goes backwards, I guess. And above the yod, you draw your first triangle, and you put the one at the top, two at the bottom left, three at the bottom right. And then you make the next triangle, which is inverted because this is, a, I guess, like a dualistic realm. You have to have the blade and the chalice. Mm -hmm. And you start with the four at the opposing point to the one because the four is a one. And then a six, or I'm sorry, then a five, then a six with a seven in the middle. Then you go over to the next ring and you do the same thing. And then you go over to the, the bottom, the vav, do the same thing. But then on the hay, you actually stop with the positive triangle. And it only goes to, this plus sign is the 22 because this represents a completion or at this point you generate an entirely new cycle from here. Right. Uh, it's the birth of a uh, worlds within worlds. It's trying to demonstrate the fractality of nature that it doesn't just stop with one self-contained sequence of 22 master builder. It then generates another spiral step of evolution up or down, depending on which direction you go. So this, this is a really well described in the, uh, the book July's end pretty mind blowing though the realization that every three numbers is a one i love right that. yeah that's really interesting it is very visual there's no way you need the visual <laughs> i did my best i did like a lot of ad-libbing to describe that verbally there's a bunch of points in the book where i have to in the audiobook where i have to add stuff that's not written in the book just uh -huh. to describe the visual there or tell people what to go look up or try to do both. I think I did a pretty good job. I think it's still understandable, but it is heady when you get into the math. That's really the only chapter that's super mathy like that and requires the graphics. So now you've seen it. Now you can go buy the book. Thanks everybody. <laughs> so I, I had a fun math moment this morning. The uh, LC, it kind of goes back to your, your thing about Ophiuchus maybe being a mercurial character. You know, because he is with that center point, that holding the center, kind of like you said, Mario, about how he's put in the middle of the zodiac. Today, I was doing triangular numbers, one plus two plus three plus four, you know, and uh, just mapping them all out. And I came upon 78. And 78 was, is my Mercury. That's my, my HG, the mercurial number. And when you, oh. <laughs> and when you add one plus two plus three plus four, you go all the way up to 12 disciples. It is at 78 on number 12. And so oh, that's interesting. So right. it's, it's yeah, the 12 enclosed in one. Yes. Yeah. And NPC so this is, points out that uh, the seasons change on the 21st. That's really interesting because in that thing I just showed after mm -hmm. the 21, the 777 is when the next cycle begins at the uh the 22 becomes the one of the next cycle that's why you don't have the next triangle right Boom. because 22 is a, reduces to a one in theosophical edition that's, that's a good catch npc do you, you want to uh, do you want to have a look at some of these um the the luminaries and how they've related i'll show a little bit of, if you like yeah, yeah, we, you can definitely screen share. Anybody has the right to screen share in okay. this chat. Okay. By the way, thanks to everybody, for you guys, for coming in here tonight and uh, helping me make this thing happen. It was an on-the-fly production and totally, totally winging it. And this has been one of my favorite rants in a long time, maybe ever, as far as gravy levels. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah. So you can see that okay? Yeah, we got yep. it. 
So what I did was um, was looking at the the lunar cycle, which is about um, they say twenty seven point three days, right? For its um, uh, it's it's uh, sidereal. Now what I did was um, I basically transferred the the decimal point, so it's point two seven, which would be twenty seven days, and then a a hundred and eight because I kept seeing these certain numbers show up. And so when you do 108 times that 0.27, you actually get the synodic um, time of the moon or near enough to it. And then I followed, followed through and did with um, Mercury as well, um, which was, you know, the 432 come out, the sun come out as 1350, um, giving you a 364.5 day um, movement. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I went through the whole lot. And basically, these were very close. It's, I, I worked it out in days. It's probably 0.2% um, off com compared to the sidereal and synodic times that they give us. And what you actually see here is this whole thing is actually built off um, 27. So that, that first moon... Um, cycle in a sense the sidereal cycle of the moon and interestingly when you actually start to add up some of these um these multiples and the synodic days and things like that and divide it as and work out the mean of the whole lot mm -hmm. you actually get the um you actually get saturn's movement so Whoa. So um, synodically, yeah. So what you actually see when you add all these up here, these, um, so it'd be four 27s, it would be 16 for Mercury, 27s, that's how long it takes for its side synodic movement, um, 50 27s for the sun, so on and so forth. And you add them up and you get a 364 and there's seven planets and you divide it by seven and then you get the 52. So that gives you that 364 day calendar with seven days and 52 weeks. Wow. And it's it related to Saturn has 52 27s <laughs> encoded in it. Um, and so you see the same thing when you add up the multiples of 27 over this side and divide it by seven, you'll get um, Saturn. And then oh, wow. on this side again, you'll load up the synodic days and divide it by seven and you'll get it's Saturn's approximate synodic time. So I found that really, really interesting, especially when you have this connection in old uh, mythologies as Saturn as the Lord of time. Right. Um, so you're actually seeing this connection here between it as the mean of all the luminaries uh, movements. So, just and, just fascinating stuff when you actually put it in a a frequency if you like of of 27 or based off the moon's um sidereal movement right and what what are the two those two dippers the two dippers at the um, north pole are two sevens yes right and before you move on to uh um, yep yeah. I want to ask, first of all, it's, this is fascinating because it does possibly solve the mystery of our Kronos timekeeper Saturn idea. Because I've been thinking it didn't make much sense uh, to have mm. Saturn be that because that's the longest cycle of all the luminaries. Like, that's not a very good timekeeper. But mathematically here, it makes sense. The yeah. 379 is what I wanted to highlight and ask you what else that might pertain to. I see that when you combine the 3 and the 7, you get the... 10 or 1 so you have a 19 or a 10 so it's reducing to 1, one. as well uh, mm. so it becomes 1 there but it's a 19 which is like a 1 and a 9 that's the masculine and the feminine together uh -huh. but what else does 379 uh, yeah. pertain to uh i'm not sure <laughs> uh, <laughs> honestly we'll, we'll solve it and uh jenny we'll pointed out one. something good the last several full moons, and I think a few more, there's like six in a row where the full moons are happening at the 27th degree of its sign, six in a row. Wow. Mm -hmm. Pretty interesting that we're getting yeah. all this 27 information at this time. 
powerful. Yeah, the other thing that's interesting, it's um, if you put it into this, if you do the multiples through this, well, basically you're looking at the sidereal time, which is in years. Um, Saturn's actually 27 years. So that's really interesting when you look at back at old sort of musicians, all these different people that have, uh, you know, kicked the bucket around 27 and the significance of 27. Um, so it's a little bit different to what they give us, which is the 29 years, but the 29 years sort of comes up somewhere else. But um, let me show you something else out of this, if I've got it here. Um, this one's... Um, just using the months and just another thing it just shows again you get this this cyclic um, nature and and Saturn shows up again with 379 and um, when you work out the months you actually get this 91 months and you divide that and it's a, a 13 13 months so it's it's showing this sort of like seven year cycle as well that there's repeats. the one in the there's nine a, again masculine feminine with the 91 yeah 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 it's like a completion yeah so 90 month, 91 months in total for these um yeah but it's just really interesting looking at these cycles in this um sort of layout and you, you probably you guys would know the significance of say um, 108 um the significance of 432 432 hertz and all that sort of stuff around it um even the pyramids have this encode of different measurement systems but they all sort of reduce down to 40 432 um, right. so there's just some really interesting significant things that's sort of going on when you place um everything in these multiples of 27. yeah, yeah the, and uh 108 sorry, is, but... i'll just say real quick hold that one mario sure well while, while i have this the 108 is a particularly interesting number because if you take the Fibonacci sequence and you add together uh, a full wheel of it, I'm trying to remember how many it takes, but it adds to 108. I'm going to have to look that information up. I, should, I jumped the gun. So it reminds me of the power of nine. So, right, one plus eight, nine, two plus seven, nine. 4329 279 1359 279 and then just the property of 9 right you guys know when it doubles it always reduces back essentially to 9 and then you even divide it and so half of 9 is 4.5 which is 9 and then you just keep on going and you're going to get nines all the way up and you're going to get nines all the way down right but, that's uh, the I just that's, that's the yin yang two, sure. two nines Oh, yeah. and you can and it's, and it's also really easy to calculate on your hands isn't it so you just move one finger down and it'll basically give you the nine times tables right and it has that reflection in it because well it's on your hands but it's also um you know 18 and 81 and all those sort of things um so yeah it's, it's very reflective and um it's a completion number for sure and I appreciate this, by the way, because Saturn is the traditional ruler of Aquarius. And so I'm like looking into all things Aquarius right now. So for me, just, this just feels appropriate. Absolutely. Cool. All, right. all right. I'll stop the uh, share. Okay. Very I'll cool. just, if you ever want to share more, you can leave that open and I'll pull it up whenever. Okay. But this is the other thing since we're talking about 26 as well, um, you can see that. 27 sort of hidden in the alphabet as well where you you're working your way up to 26 and each of those like the one and the six will add 27 the two and the 25 so it's all got this hidden 27 within it <laughs> which is just just fascinating as well yeah I have uh, an embarrassing confession i gotta go to the bathroom i'm doing a cleanse right now so <laughs> things are things are moving quickly you're all good i'll be right back so. So I saw uh, Mars had a 780 on it, which that's uh, that's my mercurial number. Uh, in uh, so that was interesting in there. But you know, Mars is not Mercury, <laughs> but it does have that mercurial number, all the same. Man, that was great. I'm gonna go back and sc screen cap all of that. Thank you, LC. That's that's some dang yeah, yeah. No worries. That I just sort of yes, it's, it's just fascinating to see that there is 
if you take away some of their sort of nonsense that they're trying to you know just fudge a few numbers here and there if it's 0.3 or whatever it is mm -hmm. you're actually taking away this connectedness of these luminaries and it's very um like they're going on their their track and they're all interlinked and i just sound that um you know that's what i was sort of looking for i'm looking for the connections between things i don't, I don't want to be in a world where the world that they've given us which is everything's separated from everything else it's not how i want to view the world you know that's right yep you know i have a question uh for anybody mario maybe start with you do you i have a sneaking suspicion that certain people uh they like let's just say the saturnian death cult whatever we call them i think that they keep their uh their symbol a secret and my theory is because if we all knew their symbol we could like go out and spray paint a saturn and put a line through it and generate and attack their symbol mm. and so like my theory is do you think there's anything to the thought that they keep it safe or obscured so that we can't directly contradict it or invert it do you think there's anything to that or it, uh there could be something to that but i also think of the idea that they might just be putting it in our faces all the time too yeah. you know what i mean and so it's oh. almost hidden in plain sight sort of thing that you know how many people wear crosses but how many people understand what the cross means you know what i mean sort of thing so they obfuscate it by uh, keeping the meaning hidden for sure yeah yeah what do you guys think i think it's yeah it's all about information overload just confusing with contradictions i think a lot of what what they do is um try to hide time and they try to hide the symbols that you know don't tell us about our world um say for the the one I always bring up is the eye of providence, you know, the triangle with the eye in it and, and, and people sort of freak out at it thinking it's Masonic or whatever it is. Um, but when you actually break it down, it's got a geometry behind it. And then you, when you apply that geometry to the Zodiac and things, it starts telling you, um, you know, how things are mapped and it's got a bunch of different sort of numbers in there that come out and, um just really interesting sort of correlations become apparent and you know these these symbols um have a lot of meaning and, uh, and can tell us a lot about you know how time works and things like that mm -hmm. you know it's their control system you know so as as much as they flash it in front of us that they, they don't really want us decoding it and and giving it to the world for free and letting them understand it um you know that's, that's why they sort of shut down flat earth or or anything that goes against their narrative you know mm -hmm. so the more we can do to actually understand their symbols and take them back and um show what they actually are and w what they apply to the more power we have i reckon so nice it's my sure. approach anyway yeah i do think that they have active campaigns against specific symbols and um i'm not sure if this is something you guys have looked into or thought about but you know um the defaming and smearing and distortion of the swastika to me is like a pretty clear example of i the swastika is such a powerful symbol and it goes back to the ursa major minor thing and the pole star and the the polar psychology that i was talking about versus the solar psychology um you know you go to the east and you see it all over the place when i was in india i was really surprised uh to see like you know there's like little rickshaw taxi things and literally it's a swastika and then it, it says aryan right next to it and, and i'm in india you know and i'm like wow that's really fascinating that i'm even seeing this here you know and so i think that um symbols that contain a lot of power obviously why wouldn't you invert that power and so to me i think that um the uh campaign that the nazis perpetuated i think in part was to demonize the swastika and so now you can't even really discuss it or use it 
otherwise you, you know what's really going to happen to you right at Ari least in the west to so, says the uh the uh, aria was not a race it was basically like a caste or a class it was the high priest class the keepers of the knowledge maybe before some kind of fall into a corrupted state or the the keepers of the knowledge became the ones who weaponized it against people yeah, and the aria it's phonetically connected to like um the iri or the i in the eye the watchers the ones who observe the heavens mm. it gives us names like iraq ireland iroquois all kinds of tribes and nations that were also demonized and campaigns to wipe them out or enslave them have occurred over throughout time that's a yeah that's a great example yeah and then even to the nazis being the axis and i think of the world axis the axis mundi and everything else too and then even the axis of the swastika itself that spins right. you know and and then let's just go the distance let's bring up the germ the germans <laughs> mm. and germ like yeah uh, one thing i've been milling over is like uh, and i'm i'm in both a foot in both worlds on german terrain whichever both and but if uh germ theory were as effective as we're told it was then wouldn't this wouldn't the ga the gas chambers have not been chemical? Wouldn't they have just in, put those people in chicken pox chambers or some kind of transmutable transmittable disease? It would be way more efficient and effective, and they wouldn't have to. If the story is what they tell us, it's so funny we have to put these asterisks behind all of our historic notes of like, if it's even close to what they say. Yeah, look, I think nothing is close to what they say, given <laughs> when you look at the the mud flood and all that sort of stuff, you're just like, no, I, don't, I have no idea what's, what's going on here now. Um, mm -hmm. So it, it's just a, a wait and see. Um, but definitely there was a, a higher culture you know mm -hmm. three things cannot long be hidden the sun the moon and the truth i love that so i've got one more uh in my in my old uh my diction of airy cipher and this is kind of playing into what you were saying mario about how maybe they uh they obfuscate uh, the power of a symbol or the power of a story. Uh, and, you know, I think of it as, is there an economy to uh, magic? And, you know, do they want to keep it uh, a rare commodity that only they have access to? And if everybody had it, would it somehow cheapen it or lessen its power? Um, but one, one thing that I found when I very first put this cipher together is that it actually has powerful correspondence to the Yom Kippur ritual. And Yom Kippur, uh, that word Kippur, it goes, it hails back to the Egyptian creation myth where the, the dung beetle, the Kepri beetle, is said in Egyptian mythology to roll its dung into a large sphere or a ball. And it also, uh, they say that it follows its shadow and it tends to roll the ball in circular patterns. And so I found that just very interesting that this an insect has this innate ability to appreciate the, the sacred shape of the circle. And so uh, when I first rolled this cipher out, I basically did the Kepri circle, the Kepri beetle circle. And I told it as a story of these letters are the footprints of the beetle leaving tracks in the sand. And the word scribe comes from scarab. And even in Latin, the word uh, for a beetle is a scada bajo. And that means it, its face is down. It has its face down. And so this uh, signifies that the beetles were an initiation they were initiating those people, and the people were worshiping them with their faces down. They were bowing to those beetles. And so um, so I roll out this circle, and then uh, 
the Yom Kippur ritual has that Kepri uh, in the name of the ritual. And the Yom Kippur ritual has to do with a division. They, uh, they have two goats of equal value. And so that's my first line across the circle, the, my, uh, my, yep, my equinox line. That's the division, the two goats of equal value. So I make my first line across. And then the men will draw lots. And so by drawing lots, I continue to divide this into equal parts. And then I get my circle is divided into 12 lots of the zodiac. And then the one goat stays in the temple. And that is my A, B, C. ABC can be rearranged to Cobb, Cabra. And a Cabra is the first goat, the clean goat that stays in the temple. And the second goat is sent out on a bit of a pilgrimage. Cast, they whisper all their sins and all the things that they've done, and they put all defilement into the uh, scapegoat. And then they send the scapegoat out on this uh, journey. And the journey consists of uh, 10 stations, 10 stopping points. Um, and those 10 stopping points, if you count from the bottom of Aries, where the zero mark is, you count that as one, and you go up to two, to three, to four, to five, to six, to seven, to eight, to nine, to 10, you end on the Z. And so the Yom Kippur ritual is encoded in the cipher. And at the end of that journey, when the the goat, the defiled goat, which is Capricorn down here at the Z at the bottom, when it gets to that final station, it is cast off of a cliff. And that cliff is represented by this pie wedge of the missing quarter of the entire cipher. And so the Yom Kippur ritual encodes the tracking, the tracing of the footprints that tells the story of the Yom Kippur ritual uh, played out in this uh, Kepri circle. Right. So, wow. That's amazing. I love that. Um, and I don't know if you've pointed this out too, but the, um, you know, some versions of the uh, Capricorn symbol almost look like they have the Aries symbol, symbol encoded into it too. The left part where it like goes downward. Sometimes it looks almost exactly like Aries. You know, there, there's a lot of variations of the Capricorn symbol, but yes. that's something that I've noticed. Um, but yeah, that makes sense to me. That's very interesting. Nice. Yeah, I've seen your variations and you're right. You're totally right. They are like two uh, very similar icons. Yeah, yeah, they're related. And actually, I see a lot of airy symbolism in Christmas as well, randomly, which takes place during Capricorn. And so for me, well, I, there's just a lot of random things. So even like the uh, candy cane to me reminds me of the shepherd's crook, you know, nice. yep. like Aries, you know, and then yep. uh, the good shepherd and everything else. Um, and then Santa's wearing red, which I think is very Aryan sort of thing. Um, I can't remember all the correspondence. Oh, even toy soldiers. That's war, you know. <laughs> and right. so it's just like reminds me of Aries and uh, being ruled by Mars and, uh, you know, the planet of war and everything else. So, yeah, Aries and Capricorn, there's a relationship there that's very, very intriguing. And it's like a whole rabbit hole you can go down, I think. Oh, right. And th th I'm so glad you said that because AZ is a phonetic equivalent of the word for goat in Hebrew. Az. Ah, uh, yeah. And the goat that gets thrown off the cliff is sacrificed to Azazel. A-Z-A-Z-E-L. Two goat, the L, the god of the two goats, Azazel. That's yeah, a yeah. good catch. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, you mentioned the Beatles earlier. Uh -huh. And, uh, man, there's so much stuff with the Beatles that's just fascinating, you know. Um, but I linked the Beatles to cancer as well. And so when I was doing my cancer dive, I just kept on thinking about Beatles stuff. And it just occurred to me, uh, I think one of the things that they encoded with their prominence and their popularity is the fact that cancer, at least from my research with what I've looked into, there's so many um, 
animals that have been associated and creatures that have been associated with cancer over mm -hmm. the ages. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons why actually is because it's very faint. It's like the most faint zodiac sign there is. So I think you can kind of like project maybe what it's going to be, um, you know, depending on where you live and culturally what's going on and stuff. So it's been a beetle. It's been a crab. You know, it's been a turtle. Um, it's been uh, a crawfish or crayfish. It's been a lobster. It's been all these different things. I made a video about it and I'm like, yeah. well, holy shit, man. I'm like, that kind of reminds me of the Beatles, how they just change all the time. It's this constant evolution. And I think that was part of the program that they wanted to put out there is that like every album that the Beatles put out, basically, they really evolved their look. And even just within, you know, their whole catalog only spans, if I'm not mistaken, 10 years. Whoa. So from their first album to their last album, I'm pretty sure it's only like it's a very short amount of time. It's like right around 10 years or something. And think about how much they changed and think about how much society changed, you know. And so yeah. when I think of the Beatles, obviously, they're the Fab Four. And so I think of the four cardinal directions. I think of the four elements. And I think you could probably figure something out with uh, each member probably being elemental or, or um you know, yeah. that the intention was for them to be elemental. Yes. And then if you look in the chariot card, which is ruled by cancer, you know, uh, you, sometimes there's four statues in front or there's four pillars around the charioteer. Right. And I don't know if you feel like pulling it up, Chance, but if you pull up the Rider weight chariot card, literally there's a white square on its chest, which looks like the White Album. <laughs> it's just the White Album. Oh, you know. snap. Nice. And then cat. obviously Crowley was in um, Sergeant Pepper's the album cover and everything else. And there's all this stuff about them basically being top magic and what have you. So mm -hmm. they can do all this esoteric stuff for the public and whatnot. So anyways, I had to mention that with Beatles because that's definitely a rabbit hole as well. Nice. Good. I got a few things to kick in about the Beatle. Uh, first of all, it's very interesting that all the cancer signs have to do with something with a hard shell, an exoskeleton, you know, and the, I'll get back to that, but the Latin name for the scarab that symbol is symbolic of the sun in Egyptian lore is the scarabaeus herculeum or something like that. It's got Hercules in the, in the suffix of the name and wow. Hercules back to the July's end book. Then that book, Dylan lays it out perfectly that the 12 labors of Hercules are the 12 signs of the zodiac and that he's representative of the sun but uh another interesting thing about that i found out recently from my uh recent guest tofer on interverse was that biological things that have a hard exterior and soft interior are orgon energy accumulators oh, yeah so to put that at the point where the sun is at the height of its power seems to have like possibly some very interesting significance as well. Just just on that, like um, what I did a fair while ago now was look at the, the Zodiac as in not 12, but eight, because there was a lot of sort of things that were pointing to this, um, the older Zodiac not being 12, but eight. And so I started doing divisions and, and looking through um, Stellarium and, and counting out basically days, 45 days, 45 days. And the way I did it, um, it, it just sort of seeing where the sun was in those signs and things. And you would start at, say, um, Pisces, where the sun is in Pisces in the, the equinox. Then I would go up to um, Gemini, which would be the horse and the man. And then um, or two horses and two men. And then you would have, um, what was it, Virgo... I think it was Virgo on the other side. Mm -hmm. But it was interesting. When you started dividing it up into eight, you actually got the two females, um, sort of the Yoni um, and the Virgin, were on one line, and they were at the the equ equinoxes. And then you, for the solstices, you had um, Gemini, which was the, the two men and the, and the two horses. And then you would have um, Sagittarius at the bottom, and that would be one man and one horse. Wow. But the division also occurred on each side where you would have um, the Aries and you would have 
um, the goat on one side, which would be the two mammals and the part of that sort of family, the red blooded. Mm-hmm. And then on the other side of the zodiac, you would have the crab and the scorpion, which would sort of be the blue bloods, in a sense. So you're starting to divide the the zodiac into uh, this red and blue idea, and masculine and feminine as well. So it, it was really interesting going through the zodiac with this eightfold sort of uh, contemplation. Anyway, yes, I hope I explained that okay. <laughs> well, Mark. Mario, you're muted. Gotcha. Sorry. Um, mm-hmm. Did you create a graphic for that by chance? Uh, yeah, I think I have a sketch of it. It's pretty dodgy, but I could yeah send it to you for sure. Just curious. That's interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're, you're going to like LC's work. <laughs> oh, I Mario. bet. I can tell. Mm-hmm. I already this, like it. This is just such a grand <laughs> convergence tonight. Wow. <laughs> Agreed. So... Uh, Mario, we're getting close to the wrap up just for the heads up. Um, okay. we'll finish up around 10. Got to give room for the flow state stream on weaving spiders after this, right? Um, uh, well, actually, Chance, you had that moon card pulled up. Go, I'll let I'll, I'll yield. <laughs> oh, just that was shared by Kaylee in the call in line, and I don't know what deck this is from, but it was nice. Oh, hermetic like tarot. Hermetic okay. tarot. There we go. Yeah. So it's got the scarab. This is the moon uh-huh. card, but ruled by cancer. It's got Anubis on both sides. It's got towers. The yeah. tower for the for the cancer card. That makes perfect sense with what we were saying about Polaris and the top right. of your cipher. Yep. And the exactly. Anubis being Saturn, once upon a time at the top tower, but conceivably, and now cast down into the bottom, which is uh, Capricorn or Aquarius, where the tower card is. Another interesting thing I noticed in your cipher, uh, let me pull that back up, got a lot of images here, was about the Aries to Leo, those two, you know, those two powerful fire signs. You have the Lamb of God, who is Christ, who is the Lion of Judah, and you have the L in Leo, the A in Aries, the M in Leo and the B in Aries. Wow. Excellent catch. The lion. The, the more lion. you look at this, the more things just pop out. Like it's, it's wicked, dude. Yeah. That's we need a, this. We need a professional Mario level <laughs> graphic of this for eternal future reference. I'm yeah. down to do it. Awesome. Awesome. It's the dude. best way to learn it, you know? Oh, yeah. and you know what? I while we have time, this is a great point. And I know Lucas, you said you had to bail, so feel free if you need to go at any point, no problem. Um, while we have time, though, I wanted to give praise and thanks for your awesome website and show that off. So here it is on the screen share. Mario's got a great art art catalog. You can get his Ooh. prints. Let's check out the prints. Uh, let's look at some of these. So this Gemini print, yes, make it bigger here. This Gemini print, he's actually offering as a prize for Weaving Spiders welcome audience in the next episode, number sixty-six. The I have instructions from Alan that I should read <laughs> about how this is going to work. So he sent me he sent me the full breakdown of how this contest is going to work. It involves Weaving Spiders welcome bingo. So he says. We need to remind every man, woman, every man and woman, 18 years of age and older about the gift giveaway. So thank you for this generous contribution to the prize pool, uh, Mario. He said, Alan says to enter your username into the drawing. We ask that you make a 25 item list, place the items on a five by five grid and post your bingo board here in the Weaving Spiders welcome chat or send it to anybody that's a spider. We'll make sure it gets there. And so basically, uh, the, the goal is that you make a bingo card and that's your entry. And I don't know how they're going to dis- decide from that, but the creation of the board and posting it to the Weaving Spiders chat is the entry for this prize. Now, if you happen to win bingo, and the way that you would win bingo is that you pick topics or events that you might expect to happen on a Weaving Spiders welcome episode, put them on your bingo board. And if you can cross five out in a row, you can win a prize. We do bingo all the time. So... Playing the game during the live stream, bingo, 
is a different prize. Just creating the board is what gets you entry to get this really cool Gemini print. And yeah, you've got prints of, wow, this is so cool. You've got prints of other art as well, but this is the one that's going to be put up for the, for the prize. Correct. So, yep. Did I get all that right? <laughs> yep. Pretty sure. So I, I want to know like LC and Mario, what uh, I'm a Leo. What do you guys identify as? <laughs> <laughs> we all know I'm Aries. It's no, no secret. Uh-huh. Well, I'm supposed to be a Leo, but uh, I'm really not sure anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a Cancer. Okay. Oh, oh, beautiful. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. I think to me, it makes need, sense. Yeah, I think we needed a Cancer in the in the Spiders crew. I think we're we got a gap in the Cancer zone. That's great. Here I Filling am. It all in. <laughs> no wonder sure. we got so much light shining on mysteries with this quaternity right here. Yeah. Yeah, this is great. So, uh, Mario, you're coming to the uh, to the flow state too as well. Yeah, yeah, I'll be there. All right. This so be to great. be continued. For sure. Yeah, and he's uh, coming on Interverse on Friday. Although that episode won't air till later, but we're gonna go deep on a lot of the stuff <laughs> and more. For Symbolic sure. studies on Etsy is getting ready to get linked in the uh, chats as well, where you can just, if you can't wait, you can just buy one of his prints there. I feel like I had something else I wanted to announce before we wrap up. Oh, yeah. Hey, people, hit me up for sound healing or Oracle card counseling sessions. Those are really excellent. And if you want more information, just check my website for that. I use tuning forks. I get your, your aura back in balance put the chakras all in the same relative strength and size of each other and give you some heads up on what made them not in balance in terms of perspective and possible traumas and psychological configurations. I'd love it if more people from the audience hit me up for some of those. They've never gone badly. They've always been amazing. And after this show, we are going to be doing Flow State on, on uh, Weaving Spiders Welcome YouTube channel. Also link that in the chats. It's an amazing time. I've got some cool stuff to read that I've been getting into lately. I know we're going to invite um, Martin back and have him read more of the L. Uh, Litton. What's his name? Boulevard Litton. <laughs> Why am I getting that wrong? The Rosicrucian book. Yeah, that crazy Rosicrucian book. Good stuff. And I, man, I'm just so grateful for the three of you for coming together with me on this improvised conversation. And I feel like we could just do this every week and keep pushing the river forward. It's amazing. Big time, big time. Oh, yeah, no, thank you. Rin Thanks for having me on. Rin did a sound healing with me in in person at a music festival of all places. So I could even hear the forks and it still worked. <laughs> 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 and that was like, just like a quick tune up. That wasn't even a full fledged session with all my implements and preparation. Nice. Yeah, so this has been great. You guys got anything to say on the way out? Promote your channels for me. Go around the horn, Gabriel, Mario, then Lucas. Uh, Slick Dissident on YouTube. Come check it. And uh, also on the Weaving Spiders on Saturdays. Don't miss out. Pack your lunch. Take a nap. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can find me at SymbolicStudies.com. And uh, all of my channels and socials and stuff uh, you can find there. Uh, yeah, you can find me at LC King. Um, I'm at YouTube and Rockfin. So, and also I have a Telegram as well, um, LC King Electric Flutter. So you can come and say hello there and chill out. Oh, there's so much knowledge getting dropped in that chat. It's one of the best ones ever. <laughs> okay, we'll wrap this up and see everybody on the flow state. Thanks for tuning in. I don't even want to turn it off, but I know we're just about to get into even more good stuff after this brief intermission. So. See you guys later. All right, guys. Take care.